Um, we are going to kick things off here, as always, just going to go over some of the ground rules for those who have not been a part of our webinars before. Um, you are all muted except for our panelists, and Keith, is his video is off, but he will answer any questions you guys have during the webinar. You can ask those either in the Q&A or uh, as a message in the chat, and then we will also open it up to questions for the audience at about uh, 6.15, so you guys can begin thinking about some of the questions that you have while Travis is presenting here. Um, hopefully we'll have Armin as well, but I'm going to start off by introducing Travis. He grew up in the metropolis of Gridley, Kansas, where there was just over 250 people. He graduated from Kansas State in 2011 with a bachelor's degree in rangeland management and conservation sciences with a minor in animal science. He uh, was married in 2012 to Alicia, and they have three crazy and wonderful children. They currently live in Wamego, Kansas, just outside of Manhattan, and he has worked in the ag industry his entire professional career. After moving in animal production, feed production, and quality assurance, he was granted the opportunity to work for a startup, and that experience propelled, propelled him to learn more about what growers need to be successful and the troubles situations they face on a daily basis. With that experience, he is honored to be working with Elevate Ag, a company that is centered on the mission of improving soil health, plant health, and ensuring that as an industry, they can utilize products and services that are better for our planet and those who inhabit it, increasing grower profitability and production while decreasing the need for high-priced chemical and synthetic inputs. So with that introduction, Travis, um, I will let you kind of start your presentation, but uh, if you want to give a quick kind of elevator speech for what Elevate Ag is and what you guys do. Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Noah, and thank you, uh, Green Cover Seed, for allowing us to be a part of this webinar series number four. And um, we're very honored to uh, to be working with, with everybody within this, this industry. And, and we're really excited about what's to come. You know, these there's there is a lot of uh, a lot of doubts right now in this industry, just based on the current happenings in our world. And and this is just a really good time for all of us to take a step back and, and understand what you know what we can do as individuals and and professionals within this industry to really propel ourselves to the next level and um, and and just really be successful. So. With that, Elevate Ag, um, Elevate Ag is part is a farmer-owned research and uh, biological-based company. We have five partners, um, four throughout the state of Kansas, and then others within uh, in Nebraska, i.e., Green Cover Seed. And we work with biologicals to improve soil health, plant health, decrease inputs, as well as look at the back-end nutrient density side of, of those crops we are growing as well. So with the situations that we have right now, as far as what's going on in our world, this is, this is a good time to, to start looking at those things differently. And as our, Logan, our slogan says, farm different, that's exactly how we want this to be approached. And we want to, we want to challenge, challenge you to think outside the box and understand a little bit more about the, the intricacies of the soil biology and plant biology and, and really bring those things to light and, and use your ability to, <clears throat> to to uh, open yourself up to be more successful. And it looks like we just had Armin join on. Welcome, Armin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, just gave a, a really quick elevator speech for, for Elevate. Do you want to, uh, do we want to jump back and do your bio real quick, Noah, or do we want to? Yeah, go yep. I'll go ahead and introduce our second panelist, um, Armin Miller. He has ranched and farmed along the Yellowstone River in Eastern Montana. Prior to receiving his animal nutrition and business degree from Kansas State, he resides currently in Manhattan, Kansas as a member and owner of Elevate Ag. Over the years, he has worked as a beef nutritionist to environmental consultant for large KAFOs that has enabled the opportunity to learn and understand the biology of manures and other nutrients that have a positive interaction with the soil and plants ability to produce. He's very excited to be a part of a team that believes in, re in regenerating the soil to a land of milk and honey. So with that, Armin, um, I guess, what is your elevator speech for, for Elevate Ag? What, what, 
drove you to start this business? Well, it is, uh, <clears throat> I worked through the feedlot industry, large CAFOs and seen this waste manure. Uh, it was always a uh, opportunity out there, but it seemed like it was always conflicting with the cost in order to get it to the field, to get it into production. And uh, what we learned was is that there's multiple different ways we can stimulate the soil on the plant. And when I started seeing the positive effects of the plant and uh, the production, we could increase production and decrease the, uh, um, uh, the other costs and that kind of stuff, whether they're synthetic or, or chemicals, and get better production. We, uh, it really made me excited of uh, um, new things to come and that kind of stuff on there. So that's how I got involved with it. Very good. Um, Travis, I believe you have kind of prepared uh, some PowerPoints so that's working for you to uh, share a little bit about the products that you guys have and the importance of biologicals. Yep, I do. Uh, finally got that figured out like, I don't know, 20 minutes ago. It was, <laughs> it was really bothering me. I'm, I've, that's pretty much all I did for uh, uh, the last year is make PowerPoints and I could not figure out why it was, was making me change so it works until you it, need it to work that's it works until you need it to work hold on just a second let me change something and i will share my screen and then we will move forward okay uh, and i i mentioned this to all the attendees before but for those who are just tuning in and watching us on facebook um keith is his video is hidden but he is going to answer any questions that you guys have in the the chat box and if you guys have any questions you can also put those in the q a and then as soon as Travis is done with his presentation, I have a couple of pre-made questions for him, um, but we will also open it up to the audience at about 6.15. So we will definitely give you guys a chance to ask those. Okay, there it is, trying to do it. Okay, uh, Noah, can you see my screen? Yep. We should be good. Okay, awesome. All right, very good. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to run through, you know, Elevate as a company, you know, what we're doing right now, go in depth on uh, one of our main products that we are working with and, and give you the background of why we feel it is so successful and, and so important to what we as a company are, are and as an industry are doing and, and really kind of ground ourselves in, in the total understanding of what microbial diversity means to um, soil health, plant health, and, and a thriving environment. Um, so with that, we will jump into this deal. So, you know, one, to, to kind of ground ourselves here, you know, there is, there is an issue of poor soil health and, and decreasing profitability. And, and, and we all know this, but these are, these are serious issues affecting our farmers today. And, and we want to be able to help provide, come on, go back, provide, the, the building blocks to regenerate soil and soil's bi the biodiversity in a thriving operation. So very short, sweet, and simple. So that's kind of your elevator's pitch, but that is, that's why we're here. So we're here to help. You know, to start this off is, is the structure. You know, a, a, good, a good point is, you know, uh, Dr. Christine Jones, she mentioned that a teaspoon of soil contains more microbes than all the humans on planet Earth. And, and when it comes to making choices like this, Hold on, hold on just a second, Noah, I'm sorry. Something's not working here correctly. All right, let's try this again. <clears throat> okay, okay, here we go. So let's start this over, how about we? You know, I love live videos. <laughs> All right, so here we go. What are we gonna do today? All right, so where we are, who we are, what we're doing, what our products are, as mentioned, microbial diversity, and then what's to come. You know, what are we dealing with today, and then, and then where, do, where does this lead us into the future? So, as mentioned, we are owner-operated, five partners, found, and these are the locations that we are currently in. So, uh, Green Cover Seed up in the Blade, Nebraska, and the newly opened location, Iowa, Kansas. Tiffany Cattle Company in Harrington, Kansas. Chris Sainer out in Goodland, Kansas. Clint Cox with Long Island Farms out in Long Island, Kansas, and then obviously uh, Armin Miller, who's on the phone with us in, in God's country in Manhattan, Kansas. So 
this is uh, this is um, we feel this is a really good representation of, of the areas that we want to be in and, and the growers that we want to impact and you know um, having a good spread out piece of this is how we feel we're most uh, effective um, so moving on from there you know back to the slide I was on is, is you know, it is amazing to think about the amount of microbes that we have in our soil and the, the small amount that it takes to fill up a, you know, a petri dish. But and as just Dr. Christine Jones says, this is, they, we need to understand the role of these microbes and play to work with, not against them. So the understanding of giving the microbes the, the ability to be diverse and giving a diverse, diverse food system to that environment creates a symbiotic relationship. And understanding that, that structure is, is crucial to, to uh, reinvigorating, regenerating a thriving environment. So we want the healthy soil to work for you. Retention of water, soil erosion, decreased fertility are all negative factors that can dramatically decrease the effectiveness of any other program that you're doing and implementing right now. So we wanna ask ourselves is, is how can we do this differently? You know, we're, we're, we're filled with so many instructions and, and pieces of information. Is, is, and the funny thing is this has become such a simple yet complex setup that to take a step back and look at these things as a, as a holistic, um, holistic approach, it's really interesting to see how small the changes are that we can make to truly bring back some of these things that have been degraded over time. So what are what are the what are the issues that we're facing today, right? So hey, Trav, hey Travis, yes. this is this is Keith. I'm just going to jump in. I don't think we're seeing the same screen that you think we're seeing. Oh, uh, we're not seeing gone. your slides advance. We're seeing uh, just all of your basically the outline of your PowerPoint. What can you see now? There you go. Now we now we see slide six. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're there. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, so back to uh, back to where we're. Thank you, Keith. Um, what are the issues facing growers today? Obviously, the top one is is COVID nineteen. That that's affecting more than just you know one thing. That's affecting the world economy, and and the world economy affects everything that we're doing. So moving down from that, you know, high input costs, which we've mentioned already, low selling opportunities or options, weather unpredictability, you know, and then the fear of what's coming next. Next, you know, we live this. We live this business on a day-to-day -day basis, and without without knowing what's coming next, it's hard, next to hard. It's hard to plan. So, if we can put things in place, put practices in place, use products that we feel are going to, you know, propel ourselves to the next year and to the next year, that that's what gives us the security. You know, and and this year is a perfect example of nobody would have ever expected COVID-19 and the havoc that it could have ran on every single industry that we could think of. So. How do we challenge ourselves and how do we think differently and how do we you know, bring ourselves to the point where we can be successful year over year and start to offset these costs? So something to, to think about is, is you know, microbes. This is a Clint Cox, one of our partners out in Long Island. He, he mentions that microbes function like fertilizer factories. By increasing the topsoil fertility, we can slowly become less dependent upon synthetic fertilizers. We can decrease our carbon footprint growing and in the soil where it belongs and to have a proactive voice in the climate change conversation. You know, this is something we've been hearing back for however many umpteen years about climate change and what we need to be doing as an industry to, to start working towards this. Well, I, I feel like this is a perfect opportunity for us to really, to really push the envelope on this and start to understand that we as an industry can have a massive impact on what on what this, on the worldly views of, of what we, what we're doing on a daily basis and how we treat our, how we treat our land and how we, how we, you know, grow to the next level. And, um, you know, COVID-19 is not a great thing by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, I think it, it, it provides an avenue for us to be, you know, put us to the forefront of, of understanding what we can do better as an industry and, and do that in a more um, proactive way. Um, so we know as farmers and rancher, our primary passion is, is the love of the land and obviously the stewardship of its resources. The current ag system is, is broken and, and we believe that in, in leaving more on the table when the day, that we, we believe that in leaving more on the table when the day is done and, it, and we believe that it's, it's time to farm different. So you're going to hear that, that phrase a lot, farm different, but that is, that's what this is truly built upon. 
So the question I want to ask you is, is what will it cost not to change? You know, that's a powerful question to think about and it goes deeper than just those, those few words, but it's something we truly have to sit back and think about and, and really um, look at ourselves and look at our operations and, and understand where we can be different, but Elevate is here to help with that. So to, to move, move past that piece there, we want to get into the product that we are working very closely with right now. We have multiple products, but the, the hyper grow product is, is what we're really, really, really excited about. And, and what we feel is, is really going to push this, push the envelope of what we're doing on a daily day to day basis and, and give us the most success here in the near term and the long term. So the, the hypergrow product focuses on, on three main, three main items, plant health, soil health, and, and the nutrient density of, of the crops that we're growing. So very short, very short, sweet and simple, but it covers all the different bases that we feel are important to, to what we need to be doing in the future. So give you an idea, you know, here is, here is the hypergrow product label. And there's a lot of words on this label and we're gonna go through them one by, not one by one, but close. But there's so much packed into this product that we are very excited about how the diversity of microbes, how the, the everything is gonna work in sync here and create a, a really unique environment around that root structure and that, and that plant structure as well. So the three questions on the, on, the, on the right are what I want you to be thinking about is, what is microbial diversity and why do we need it? And let's, let's, let's review back to what Christine Jones, Christine Jones says, is how many microbes are in a teaspoon, right? And then are they all needing the same nutrients to survive and thrive? So just keep those things in your back of your mind as we walk through this piece of uh, this, uh, this product. So the shout out number one here, you know, we, we have a compost tea within our product, which is a combination of a dairy and beef mix compost. By blending those two together and extracting the microbes out, the increase in the diversity is something that can be measured and create activity in most soil environments. So we all know that even on a, within a, uh, a quarter mile stretch, if you have a field, you can have two different soil types in the same field. So we believe that this, this piece here gives us the adaptability between any kind of soil environment we could throw this thing at, which is super exciting. The next piece is, is the chitin, the chitazan. And the, this is probably one of the, the uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't call it least well known, but it is the it is one of the up and coming pieces of of how we feel this industry will will thrive and 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 take to the next level. Is is chitazan is is a natural form of chitin, which is a is a compound or a metabolite derived directly from crustacean shells, and it allows the plant to strengthen the cell wall. It increases its plant's ability to fight off insects and then mitigate the risk of stock damage due to weather events. So you get out west where the wind blows every single day, that is a real thing. So if you have a natural born opportunity to, to strengthen that cell that wall and that stock, you're gonna put yourself in the upper echelon of, of, of mitigating some of that risk. You know, there's, there's data out there that shows that Plants do this amazing thing automatically when chitin, when chitin or chitazan is input into the, the, the pores of a plant, it automatically secretes chitinase. And chitinase is a natural deterrent for pests. And actually, if a plant comes or a bug comes by and, and bites on the stalk of a plant or the leaf of a plant, it will actually, that metabolite chitinase will start to dissolve that plant, that, that bug's exoskeleton. So it is a super powerful tool. And it's something the plant does automatically. I mean, it is a natural born defense mechanism, which is fascinating. And also the, the overall structure of it, it really works with all the nutrients that we have in this product and it holds them all together. So when it hits the soil and it, it starts that conversion process, that plant is immediately able to take up those nutrients and do it in a fashion where you are, where it's efficient and you're not leaching or wasting anything as well. Next one would be the seaweed, the sea kelp. You know, this is, this is products that have been used for, for a very long time and, and good seaweed, good sea kelp comes from an area that is a mixture of, of salt water and fresh water. And within that seaweed, there is three distinct hormones. I'm not gonna try to pronounce them before you because I would do it incorrectly. But these hormones are crucial to seed germination, root size as the plant mature, matures. So the list of of what seaweed could do for a plant is like 67 different things that you could, you could 
C through seaweed. It is a it is a superhero for for a plant. And you put you're starting to see here as these th first three things that we've done. You're like this is a lot of stuff for that that plant to to take in, but go back to what that plant needs to survive and thrive. It, it's, it's giving it everything it needs so it can't, doesn't have to work on the back end to try to go out and find it. So we're, we're super excited about seaweed. It's, 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 it's proving to be a, a, a massive contributor. Um, the next piece is, is the humic acid. You know, this is obviously assisting and holding on to the nutrients in the soil, and it creates an environment for increasing seed germination, the plant soil health, while also increasing soil moisture and soil moisture infiltration and retention. You know, uh, water is crucial and understanding how to retain more water and, and give that soil the ability to be more porous and soak in more water and hold that water for times that we don't have the rain. You know, out west, they're looking for a rain bath. And this is something that guys have tried in the past, but maybe hadn't done, you know, over, uh, over a year, over a year period and, and just kind of, you know, didn't, didn't, go, down the, didn't go down that path anymore. So, but, to give you an idea, the shelf life of humic acid is like two to 3,000 years. I mean, it stays around for a long time, but it is, is, it is very key in, in that nutrient holding and then breakdown of those nutrients once you get it into the soil. And then, you know, the, the, the good old worm poop. You know, we, we love our worm poop, and worm poop is, is some of the most uh, dense nutrient available products out there. It is it is truly the most complete nutrient dense organic fertilizer known to man. And, you know, just a very small amount of worm castings. I mean, you can read the numbers there, but it's 5X the available nitrogen, 7X the available potash, and 1.5X more calcium found than the top 12 inches of topsoil. I mean, it's that dense. So thinking about all these things, you've got the chitin, you've got the humic acid, you've got, you've got the, the uh, compost, now you're throwing in worm castings and the seaweed. I mean, you're putting a massive diverse amount of microbials in this product. And you're, you're, giving, it, you're giving that plant a lot of opportunity to be successful. So this, this is the kind of the, the thousand foot view of this product, but it is so much more dense than, you know, just the five shout outs that we've done here so far. I mean, there is, there's so many things going on here that the, that it's there's we could talk about it for an hour and a half which I know we don't have that but you know that's that's why we feel that you might think we're throwing the kitchen sink at the plant but this is truly why it is is because of the diversity between it so to to move past this just a little bit and and show you you know what we've seen in the field is you know here are two pieces of very very simple straightforward data you know this is this is uh, um, Tiffany Cattle Company down in Harrington, Kansas, and then Long Island, Kansas out in, or Long Island Cattle out in Long Island, Kansas. So Tiffany did a, a direct study of two side-by-side -side fields. Uh, the fields name were Lothar and Tumac. And to show you the power of what we did here is he put down 50 pounds of nitrogen and a 3X rate of a gallon and a half of hypergrowth. So in furrow, and then two shots of foliar on this Lothar side. And then for his control, he did double the amount of nitrogen and then an in furrow rate of a gallon and a half of hypergrowth and the results speak for themselves on the right hand side. For Lother, he was able to see a 26 bushel increase to the acre by increasing that amount of diversity in the soil and then also doing more of a, a foliar application at very critical points in that gr like plant, plant's growth period. And to, to go back to that, you only have a short period of time to grow this plant. Your growing season is only so long. So the more times that you can stimulate that plant and stimulate the biology and stimulate the microbes, the better you are to maintain a healthy plant. And it shows in the second piece of data there as well. You know, he went, this was Clint Cox down in Long Island. He did 94 pounds across the whole thing, hypergrow on one side, no hypergrow on the other. And so 17 bushel to the acre increase versus a control. And that was on a dry land piece of ground. I mean, it is, it's pretty amazing to see some of these results. Now, are you gonna see a 26 bushel to the acre every single time? No, probably not. But that is, that is the power of what, if you have the right situations and the right management practices, you put these things together, you can see some really unique, um, really unique results. So, um, Armin, anything you wanna to add to this point here before we move on? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good, it's, it was explained well. Okay. Um, we just see increases in, in a variety of different uh, uh, 
uh, environmental situations uh, we see, uh, we've done tests with uh, wheat uh, at K-State and that year it droughted out, but we still seen a protein difference, even though we didn't see a production difference. So what we're learning is, is that it, it, it tries to make the best of the worst situation at all times on there, so. So here's to give you an idea of, of what we're going to be using Hypergrow on in 2020. I mean, the list is long, but we feel like it could be longer. Obviously, the top four or top three are uh, the three big ones, you know, corn, beans, wheat, but uh, barley, triticale, uh, triticale, alfalfa, popcorn, sorghum, milo, buckwheat, cover crops, and then also we're going to do some trials on some native range ground and then also go back ground here in the Flint Hills of Kansas. So. It, you know, you think it's the kitchen sink and microbes. Well, that kitchen sink and microbes can affect just about everything. And there's, there's, not a, there's not a situation that we don't feel that we could see a response on. That's why we want to do as much as we can right now to understand what's, what it's going to affect, what microbes are really pinpointed in all these things that we're putting in there, and what kind of, um, you know, overall impact it can have on the full operation. So to kind of, you know, bring this to a you know, a, a lasting impression is, is we believe that with healthier soil, you have a healthier plant. With a healthier plant, you have a healthier crop. In a healthier crop, you have a nutrient-dense situation, okay? That nutrient-dense situation can go a lot further than just, you know, feeding cattle or feeding hogs or feeding chickens. It comes back to us. So understanding the, the, the delicate balance and the relationship between if we eat healthier food, we're going to be healthier in the, end, in the end as well. And if we can start that from the beginning, and start to improve that time after time or year over year, you know, there's no reason that somewhere down the road we can't eat and eat vegetables and fruits and grains to help with different sicknesses and different diseases because these things were developed naturally and, you know, this is a good time to be start thinking about that again. We don't want to get down that rabbit hole just yet, but that's how Elevate is thinking about this and to do that we have we, uh, we have a little teaser here and we can't give you all the information just quite yet, but this is how we want to, to push this needle forward. And we want to make sure that, you know, as a individual and a producer and an end user, you have the ability to step out and go, okay, I did this differently. How is it affecting me? And how can I do, how can I gain a premium in the market? Or how can I understand what's going on out there, you know, just by using something in, in you know, I could set in my hand. So to, uh, to kind of go to that, I'll come back to this screen here, but I want to tease you just a little bit with a, uh, with a video, if my mouse will work. And uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's just a little teaser. So I hope that gathered just a little bit of interest. And what I can tell you is, if you want to see more about this, this, piece of, this piece of analytical equipment and nutrient dense grain quality equipment, we are going to be having a producer meeting here in a couple weeks on May 5th, place and time to be determined. But if you want to be involved with something like this, go to our website, sign up, and you'll, be, you'll receive a personal invitation to to, uh, to where it's going to be, when it's going to be. It'll be a live event, so stay tuned for more updates on, on this, this here itself. But, uh, um, and with that, I want to uh, go back to you, Noah, and open it up for, for whatever questions we may have or, um, and, and go from there. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, first of all, for kind of presenting that. I guess my first question that uh, I hear a lot, and I'm sure you get a lot, is how is this different than a bug in a jug product? I mean, you, you talked about throwing in the kitchen sink. So what kind of separates this from a lot of the other competing products out there? 
It's a good question. Um, the the biggest the biggest difference here is is the the products that we have paired together. You know, you can put a bug in a jug, right? But you're not you're not getting the the diversity of the worm castings to start with. You're not getting the diversity of the the chitin. You know, those are two big things right there that you aren't seeing in other products. You, you'll see products with humic acids in them, uh, different. Uh, different endophytes, you're seeing different, um, different types of uh, mycorrhizae, different things like that, but you're not seeing the, the true, you know, pushing the envelope of, of plant deterrent, excuse me, insect deterrent, and then the organic matter and the natural nitrogen and different products that come from, from the worm castings. I think that's one of the biggest differences that we have over the, over the competition. Anything to add there, Armin? Nope. Part of it is, is that the, with the humates uh, that we're utilizing with that also, we are able to hold on to it because of the charge that it has. Um, and also the diversity in there for the, the different, we, we need micronutrients for the microbes and, the, and the, all the biology that goes along with producing more microbes. But we also need, uh, the ability to hold on to other nutrients that we supply to the soil and that's where the humates come into this thing and there's a lot of bugs and jugs that uh, um, that that provide you with uh, the biology but uh, it's the, the holding on to the nutrients so the biology can stay alive longer on there or at least go into a dormancy stage so they can be worked back up again once they hit a carbon source and that Okay. Um, can you guys explain if treated corn, bean, or wheat seed works as effectively with your guys' products versus a, a non-treated seed? Does that seed treatment counteract the good elements of uh, your, biolog your biologicals? Uh, no, I, I would say no, they do not uh, counteract. Because we've done some tests at K-State on some wheat seeds. And we've done it with uh, just a straight wheat seed along with uh, one that's been treated. And we did not see any uh, a differential, but we did see a differential in the germination rate uh, of that. We've seen uh, that we increased in uh, basically 66 hours, we increased the germination by about uh, 12 to 15% on there. So, but we did not see with the uh, seeded tree uh, or not on there, so. Another thing to throw in there, Noah, is, you know, even though you may have a seed treatment on there, if you're able to put that in an infro basis, you are jump-starting that biology. So whatever you have in the soil is going to be that much more efficient. So that first root or that, that endosperm that pops out of that seed, it's going to be the first one to go start taking advantage of that. So what you have in there is going to be really beneficial. Okay. So Armin, you touched on some of the trials with K-State. Um, what kind of trials are you guys doing both on a farm uh, and university level to continue getting some data on these products? Go ahead, Travis. So I can, I can handle that. So we have, we have our five partners or four partners that we are working extensively with. We're gonna have five trials per partner. So we'll have 20 trials total within a partner setting. And those will be on wheat, corn, beans, triticale, alfalfa, popcorn, barley, and buckwheat. And then we, will, uh, we are applying for a, uh, a university type um, grant to work with, farm, with growers in both Nebraska and Kansas to um, do some different studies on uh, tissue analysis, um, soil density, bulk density, as well as nutrient density at the end as well. So we're going to have a full scope, I'm hoping a full scope of data by the end of this year. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So many different diverse situations and soil types and, and uh, just uh, geographies that we're, we're really excited about the way this, this could shape up. Okay, uh, can you guys describe the pros and cons of your product versus um, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor? We're hearing a lot of uh, hype around that. What would be the difference between this and uh, the Johnson Sioux compost? Go ahead, Armin, I'll let you handle this one too. Well, the Johnson Sioux compost is a, um, a derivative of a high bacterial that uh, eventually changes over to uh, uh, has a high fungal content due to, due to the high bacterial time. 
And so it is a very good compost to extract because you get a, a very beneficial uh, bacteria in a, in a good level of fungi. That fungi isn't uh, necessarily mycorrhizal, but it's a good positive fungi. The difference between what we're bringing to the table, we not only bring that, but we also bring the other, like uh, in the uh, seaweed extract, you're bringing 67 different micronutrients that aren't provided in the Johnson Sioux. We're also bringing a lot of the, uh, the hormones that come along with that. Uh, you, you take along with the uh, worm castings in the Johnson Sioux, it does heat up, so it's kind of hard to keep worms alive in a hot environment until it gets cooled down. That's when the worms will start coming in. I think we're bringing a lot more with the extract of the worm environment out of there. And also uh, when you add in the chitinase, um, that's a, a big benefit to it. The other benefit is, is that the humic acid that we're bringing, yes, they're getting some humus out of that, but the humic acid has a, a lot longer shelf life uh, and, and a holding capacity than what the humus does on there. So that's some of the differentials. Uh, the Johnson Sioux is a very, very good uh, compost, and uh, you know, if anytime you can take the time to make it, uh, I'd highly recommend it. Okay. Uh, so, if a grower had, say, fifteen dollars an acre to spend on one crop, what would be the best method of application for this? And then also, can you guys touch on how much does this actually cost per acre? Right. So, so that's a really good. I mean, a really good thought. And, you know, we've talked about jumpstarting the biology. So if we have the ability to do an infro treatment, that's huge. Jumpstart biology. The next thing is, if you're looking, if you have the ability, most do on the foliar side, you know, the efficiency factor, the efficiency rating of, of putting product on a plant only increases, you know, after the fact, especially if you're putting on the leaf, the surface of the leaf. So if you have an 80 to 90% chance of effectiveness, through application, that is what you want to do on the foliar side. So if you had 15 bucks an acre, that's three applications of, of hypergrow right there. And um, giving, um, giving that plant that extra stimulant throughout that foliar period of that growth stage period is what you're going to want to do. And then as far as the, the cost, what we're doing right now is we're, we're offering this product in uh, 275, 265 gallon shuttles or plastic totes. And then also we can work in tanker loads as well, which is a 6,000 gallon rate. And right now we're doing uh, $5 a gallon on the tote cost. And then um, at, at the same for, for a tanker uh, pending, pending freight and location as well. So it's, um, we have multiple shipping locations. So there's, there's always an opportunity for, um, for uh, capturing better freight rates as well. What is the, the application rate then? Obviously we saw a little bit of that with uh, mm -hmm. Tiffany's, but what are you guys recommending? Yep, so recommendation on a foliar basis, specifically we'll start with wheat because that's what's already growing. So right now, we, if you top dress your wheat, you want to put a gallon and a half an acre at a top dress and then a gallon and a half an acre at the flag leaf stage. You're hitting it in two distinct points. One, when it's starting to just come out of dormancy and then second, right before it hits that reproductive stage. So stimulating that plant during the most important times, corn, you're looking at V3, V4, and then also right before silking, if you're doing foliar. Okay, anything you wanna to add to that, Armin, or? No. Okay. Um, can you guys speak on the importance of root exudates? Obviously with biology, what kind of role does this product play with the root exudates themselves? Okay, Noah, with the, when you do this on a foliar basis, what it basically is doing is stimulating that plant. It absorbs it through the leaf and it stimulates down into the roots, which causes it to kick out. It'd be like a, uh, oh, um, giving it a, us as a stimulant, like a Red Bull, you know, it gives us a, it, it wakes us up kind of. <laughs> and that's about what this is doing to the plant in order to stimulate an extra, to get, they give sugars out in order to feed those microbes and then in turn we just cycle that back. So what we're doing is building that biology and building it to a greater level by stimulating that plant to do that more often. So we're just actually causing it to kick out more exudates at that period of time which 
then causes that plant to pull up more sugars and be healthier and ward off more insects and that kind of stuff in that period of time on there. Okay. Um, I think at this point we will open it up to audience questions. So if you guys have your questions, go ahead and start typing those in, put them in the Q&A. We've got a couple here that we can start with. Um, we've got two questions from Tucker and Ellis that both asking on the shelf life. Is this something that you have to apply as soon as it's received? Nope. Nope. nope you do not. I mean, the shelf life is, is great as long as you don't let it freeze. I mean, that's, that's the biggest piece. I mean, as well as, you know, if you, if you're able to, if you've got a tote, you want to make sure it has aeration. It can breathe because you've got living organisms inside that step, that tote. So if you do have a sealed tote that's going to go anaerobic on you, because that there won't be any oxygen um, exchanged with those with those living microbes. So, so basically, it, it, <clears throat> with it being uh, some live microbes in there, yes, it is best in order to uh, apply it as as soon as we can. We can um, we have seen it where we've kept it around for up to a, uh, four or five months and re-agitated it again and uh, we've seen a result from it. I I can imagine and guarantee that it's not as strong as it would be right up front uh, just because of the biology and, and consuming the carbon that's in there and that kind of stuff but uh, we, we do see results. I've actually uh, had it frozen uh, and they used it the next year and we still seen about a 12 to 15 bushel differential in corn. Um, the microbes that were there, according to the uh, uh, <clears throat> research people there in, in Colorado State, uh, uh, Wallenstein, he, he says that basically what happened over the winter that they, they, they didn't die off, they just slowed down. And in that process of slowing down, uh, once you re added water to it and we did add some sugars to it and he says basically you grew some of it back but most of the mainstay nutrients stayed uh, in there like the humates and that kind of stuff they did not leave uh, sunlight does do the worst damage to it uh, of all the above on there but as travis mimicked uh, it it does last a long time so we do get some shelf life out of it okay uh, a question from Don, how does this affect the bacteria to fungi ratio in our soils? Right up front, it's going to increase your bacterial count because of the sugars that the plant is kicking out. But after that, the, the fungal will come back or come and get in line because we need the bacterial first before we get the fungal out of the deal. And if we got a plant in there, that's when we can start with the mycorrhiza fungal. It needs a root in order to contact. So. Um, they will readjust as we get going, but right up front, uh, we're going to see a little bump in the bacterial count, and which that in, in turn is helping uh, stimulate, because there's a, a, a digestion process that's stimulating the CO2, which is one of the limiting factors to grow on a crop, is the amount of CO2 that we're producing. So if we don't have a biological active soil, we're not producing as much CO2, which in turn that becomes our hindrance in, in our growth for the day. Um, and without, without a large part of that CO2 being released by microbes, that's, uh, is it, we, we need the bacteria in order to do that. Uh, Mike McDonald is asking, can you guys talk about the process from beginning to end on how you guys develop HyperGrow? And what are the key steps to develop the Cheatons and other key elements that Travis was talking about? And Mike, I'll, I'll answer that by saying we're not going to give away all our secrets quite just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, guys, and kind of talk about um, what that process is like. Uh, so it, it, this process started, as, you, as I said earlier, I come out of the feedlot industry. I had a waste manure product uh, that I was trying to deal with economically getting it to the field. So as we've learned and keep on learning, uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, we've learned that you know we could we could create uh, you know like a, a compost tea, and then we learned that we could ex extract it, uh, meaning that we would really didn't wake up the microbes very far, and we brought a lot of nutrients out of it. 
then we learned that we could add different things to it in order to hold on to some of those. That was the humates. Um, so in this process, we've learned different things of, of how much humates to add because we found out more wasn't better, even though they do a lot of things. Um, we also uh, found out that more in the microbe field uh, isn't bad either or, or good uh, if you don't have the food and you don't have the nutrients. And so uh, we've, it's just been a trial and error of, of trying different things, doing a lot of testing and, and putting it on farms and seeing once how it works at different types of, of uh, seasons. One thing we have learned, if we could make it economical enough in the farming, is the more times we can spray it every, say, every 10 to 14 days, we would get a boost every time. Uh, unfortunately, economics do not allow us to run a, a spray rig or something out there. Now, chemigation, that works fairly well, and we have done some of that in order to stimulate that plant. Um, as far as making the product, uh, basically, there's a, you know, we, we've worked down to a formula and uh, a time that we aerate it and how we move it and all that kind of stuff on there. So like uh, Noah said, we're not giving away everything here. So. so kind of speaking on giving away, Keith, if you are um, still with us, if you want to talk about what Green Cover Seed is doing with these products, um, I think now would be a good time to kind of talk about that and what the future looks like as far as uh, the cover crop seed that we are obviously selling. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Noah. Um, yes, I've been lurking here in the background, <laughs> listening and learning just with everybody else. So what we're going to be doing here at Green Cover Seed, uh, since we're a partial owner of the company, uh, obviously we're going to be offering these products for sale. Uh, but our emphasis is going to be on the application of the HyperGrow products, specifically on uh, the cover crop seed. And so what what we're going to be doing, going to be offering is uh, to be able to put this on as a seed treatment. Uh, when you order cover crop seed, we can apply it right on the cover crop seed. We are going to be looking, um, one of the projects that Travis and Armin are going to be working on this year is trying to figure out how, how high we can push some of these levels, particularly with some of the chitin and the seaweed, can we go to higher levels of this for a, a seed treatment product? Because even though those products are very expensive, uh, the minute amounts that we're using as a seed treatment, uh, we think that we can still have a very affordable product and have higher levels of some of these real valuable products, particularly the chitin and the seaweed extract. So we're still kind of working on that right now. We're just using the regular HyperGrow uh, that Travis described, but we are looking at kind of creating, if you will, a, a, a higher concentrate uh, seed treatment version. So uh, if you're ordering seed from Green Cover Seed, you can request to have HyperGrow put on it. Um, we're going to, as we learn more about this, we're going to have the salesman uh, kind of suggest that. Uh, because it is going to be a relatively low cost uh, option to get some additional biology on there. Uh, we can set you up also if we're shipping seed out to you. Uh, we're hoping to very soon have a pretty good inventory or supply of the HyperGrow in the liquid shuttles like Travis talked about, uh, so that if you are getting some seed and want to try a shuttle of the HyperGrow product, we can do that as well. Or we can line up tanker loads as well. We may not necessarily have that on site here, uh, but we can definitely uh, get that um, lined up to be shipped uh, directly out to you. So uh, we pretty much have all of the products. And, and if you're just interested in humic acids, uh, we do uh, um, Elevate Ag and Green Cover Seed. Both will be selling just the humic acid products by themselves as well. Uh, they didn't touch a lot on that, but we certainly have that as an option. And, you know, one, one of the reasons that we decided to invest in um, Elevate Ag as a company uh, the thing that really is attractive to us about it is that it's a small company. There's a relatively small number of owners, and we feel like it's a company that as we learn new things, as new discoveries are made, as new products uh, come available, uh, we can change very quickly the formulation of what we're doing or add new products uh, to the arsenal of what we have available. So we think it's going to be a very responsive receptive company to change. And, and one thing I know about this biological world, uh, with the rate of information that we're learning, it's going to change a lot. And so that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about being part of Elevate Ag is that we think that we can 
uh, change our product formulations and offerings uh, with the best knowledge uh, and technology that's available at the time. Yeah, so you just kind of mentioned the humic acid. Uh, I've heard talk about humates and those kind of things. Um, does Elevate Egg sell all of those products direct or how does that work? And what are the benefits of those? Uh, if you want to kind of touch on that, Armin. Say that again. <laughs> no, uh, just on, on humates and kind of the humic acid, is that something that you guys are selling as well? Yes, yes. It, uh, okay, so there's a, I, out of the humic acid, uh, you, you have uh, three parts of it. It's the human, the humic acid, and the phobic acid. The uh, human side is more of the solid side or the structure side. When you put this into a liquid form, uh, you you reduce that amount of human that's in there. So it's basically a humic acid with a phobic. Now the phobic acid in a molecule size is a lot smaller than the humic acid size. So that means that the leaf can absorb it. But what we've seen is anything past about three to 4% of the total uh, liquid humic acid, we seem to be uh, negating or not seeing much of a benefit from it. So you want part of it to be a humic acid and part of it to be a phobic acid, which that's what we're getting with that. Um, this stuff looks like black crude oil um, and uh, you can dilute it down with water very well. It does have a, a pH of about 12. So you wanna watch, uh, do a jar test as you're, as you're mixing with things and that kind of stuff on there. Uh, so you don't uh, get it to tie up. But as uh, far as the holding capacity, it's, uh, it does a beautiful job of holding on to your nitrates, uh, whether it comes in an ammonia form or in a uh, um, uh, 32 uh, form or whatever. Just wanna make sure we got plenty of carbon with it. That would be like a molasses and that, and also a molly with it on there, so. So are there, Shorty uh, Fleas is asking here, are there negatives to too much humic acid? No, uh, you just, you're just spent, the, the negative is you spent money on something that you, you aren't getting the benefit right away from. It, down the road, it helps like, uh, say you're gonna put out for uh, calcium in order to correct your PC, pH in your soil. Uh, one thing limestone likes to do is go down in the soil. It's heavier. Uh, the humic acid will help hold it up and it only takes on a dry basis. You can uh, get the stuff in a dry, about 12 pounds per ton of uh, calcium or limestone that you put down will help hold that in the area for the plant and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different things that humic acid does, but more won't hurt it, but it's you're just wasting money. So... I'm kind of going backwards here a little bit, but you guys had touched on like farm trials university. Can you guys talk about why you're leaning more towards the farm trials and not university based research? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good way to, to, to phrase that, you know, the, the ability to study the different diverse situations through farmer research is a, is a really, really good opportunity for us to showcase what the products can do in very different soil types, very different um, um, situations, different geographies, different things like that. And, and the ability to measure on a more complete analysis. And, you know, the, the university side doesn't give us the, the overall view of what that ROI looks, for, looks at for a, a producer or for Elevate. So, Using that direct farmer ability, that direct farmer research, it is a I mean, it's coming right from the source. So we feel that is is super powerful information. And nothing, not not that there's anything wrong with the university-based research, is that that the you know, the farmer research speaks it speaks volumes. It really does. And having that real real-time information is very critical. You know, one of the things that the when I when I worked with K State and other universities. Uh, uh, is that they wanted to test a thing and, uh, and see one thing. And uh, unfortunately, Mother Nature doesn't respond like that. So really, when it all come down to it, we were just wanting to make sure that one, we were improving soil health. We were <clears throat> increasing the, what we were producing. And we were making it more nutrient dense, whatever we were producing. So 
We wanted bushels, we wanted nutrient density, and also increase the soil health. And that was real hard for the universities. Uh -oh. Well, we might have lost him. <laughs> he froze. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think to, to piggyback on that, it's, it was hard for the universities to try to pare that down and, and do it a uh, more a total view method. You back, Armin? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we lost the last 15 seconds. <laughs> Trustworthy internet nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Travis covered for you. All right. Um, question from Ellis Yoder. Will your products have similar yield results? regardless of how healthy the soil is already. So basically, will a yield boost come on 4% organic matter uh, the same as it would on 2%? Well, this is what we've seen in, in farming, large farming operations, where we've seen some organic matter in that 2-1 uh, uh, that when we did the Haney test on, the biological uh, activity in there was real low. Uh, and then we've tested some that have been in the threes and the biological activity was real low there also. We didn't see as much of an advantage as if it was a, a one eight and the biological from a Haney test showed that it was really active. And we seen that at Clint Cox's just last year when he added uh, a liquid hog manure onto the field which caused the, the bacteria to just to thrive. And what happened was we kicked out more CO2 and he ended out uh, showing higher bushels. And uh, even though it was uh, six inches shorter at the start of the, of the season and that kind of stuff. So um, really it, it pertains more to the PLFAs out of that Haney test um, than it does to, um, you know, really equating it to the soil organic matter. Now soil organic matter has some, some play with it, it's just, uh, the more bio activity, meaning more microbes that are moving around and, and converting are uh, really is the key to this in, in making this really work on there. So uh, that's where you'll see the product work more than the other. Now it'll help out the other, but it's just not going to be as strong. Okay. There was a question earlier on where you guys are sourcing some of these products, uh, specifically on the I believe it was the Humates in North Dakota. Where are these products all coming from? And can you explain the significance of that, not all just coming from one place? And I guess I'd rephrase that again, Noah. Please. But more specifically, kind of where are these products coming from? Like the, well, not the Humates, it was forget the question. Yeah, no, no I think the question was where, where are you getting the Humates from? Uh, where are those being mined at, Armin? It, it's up in uh, the northern part of the United States, uh, up in, out of North Dakota, is where they're coming. They're not coming out of Canada. Um, that'd be nice, but uh, the freight alone adds too much cost to this thing in order to add into that. So um, that's where we've been pulling the humates out of. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you guys for tuning in this week and answering or asking all of your questions. Hopefully we got them answered. If you do have any other questions or are interested in learning more about this product, as well as the grower meeting that Travis kind of hinted at earlier, um, you guys can take a screenshot or we will share this contact information with you here. Go ahead and go like their Facebook, Instagram pages, uh, it is Elevate Ag, and they will love to answer any questions that you guys have. So with that, we're gonna wrap up. Um, I'll be sending out an email here. Next week, we're gonna have Dale Strickler back on. He's going to kind of piggyback off of this and talk about some of the inoculants and um, mycorrhizal fungi that we have available and we will do that next week. So thank you. Thank you again for tuning in and we'll see you all then. Thank you. Thank you. Travis, thanks Armin. Yeah, thank you. Bye.